Hello, and thanks for having me. My name is Derek, and I'd like to talk to you today about cartography on the web, specifically about lessons I've learned building web-based map applications. Charts and graphs and tables are great tools to communicate data to people, but maps are very special and near and dear to me because they do something I think that those other tools just can't do as well. And what they do is they contextualize the data. They allow you to show that this is nearby you or this takes up some amount of space even far away from you. It, it has some personal connection with the person because they also take up physical space. And that just hits different. I work at a place called Acloma. We're a public benefit corporation that's pioneered air pollution and greenhouse gas measurement and analysis block by block at regional scales. A large part of my work there is to take that data and turn it into pixels that are contextualized and visualized on a map. I don't know what's more personal and impactful than understanding the air that we breathe. And maps are by far an amazing way to communicate that. When it comes to the wildfires that have plagued the West Coast summer after summer, I need to know immediately how near are these fires to me? How safe am I? How big are the fires that are affecting all of these people that are nearby me and across the state? I couldn't get that with a graph. A I need a map. Even with COVID-19 cases, I've tracked this over time as most of us have, and we read numbers and we see bar charts, but seeing it on a map and knowing that our neighbors are being affected this disproportionately sometimes compared to other neighbors, it sticks with me. And so thinking about interesting data to visualize for this conference, I went through a number of different ideas and I settled on trees. I thought, what better way to talk through and, and show some of these concepts with maps than looking at one of my favorite data sets, the tree equity score. This pulls together information from income, employment rates, temperature, canopy coverage, and a number of different things to assign an equity score to a neighborhood. And you can see there are blocks that have different colorings due to that. But I wanted to dive deeper and contextualize that with the individual trees. You know, are these elm or maple or Douglas fir? And I looked around and found the Portland tree inventory does exactly that. I'm able to see what the species are, what condition they're in, and who when they were logged. And combining these two data sets, I thought would be a lot of fun. And so I made Treelandia. Treelandia, as you see here, has outlines painted to show where the equity score boundaries are. And these sliders over here in the UI definitely affect those blocks. So I'm able to see where asthma rates change, for instance. If I were instead to flip between parks and street trees, you start to see a different dimension in the data and that's starting to get at what I wanted to explore here. The biggest discovery though have been, if I zoom around here to LADS edition, instances where the equity score doesn't tell the whole story and there's a lot more going on. I see this block here that has a single score that would be a solid color otherwise but I noticed that it looks split. And so I'm able to select a few trees in here. You know, there's a maple, that's interesting, but this from the satellite view looks very neighborhoody and residential. I wander a bit west, I start seeing parking lots and places of business and it looks more industrial. And so because I can dive into the data that makes up that aggregate score, I'm able to see more fully how that was influenced from its neighboring blocks. And that's really the power of 
contextualizing data. So how do we build these kinds of applications? There are a lot of things that go into them, uh, but broadly speaking, we have to understand how browsers work with maps and how these libraries operate. We need to find some interesting data and prepare it for the map to consume. And once it's in there, we need to think about how the user would interact with those map layers, whether it's clicking and hovering and so on. And once we have that understood, we have to think about how that connects to the larger application containing the map. So to start, you need to understand some of the concepts and start here is a very big work because there's a lot of places to start. All of these uh, serve a lot of different needs. They're wonderful tools and I highly recommend looking into each and every one of them. I went with Mapbox for Trulandia because of my familiarity with it, but by and large, these all share a common core of how they have a mental model built around doing maps in the browser. They gather data sources from wherever they, they come from. They then take that and connect it with a series of style layers that stack on top of each other. You saw road labels, you saw individual trees painted, you saw the white ring around the tree I had selected. Those are all layers that are connected to different data sources. And this idea of taking content and transforming it into presentation should feel a little familiar because it's not so different from HTML and CSS. And so leaning back on analogies like this while building map-based applications can kind of help get through some of the tougher concepts. With Mapbox, it's pretty straightforward seeing that source to style layer transition because once you've added the instance of the map you can just add a source define what that looks like and then connect it to a layer that has some bits about color and size and so on now i think we're ready to translate our data into a format that's ready for the map there are a lot of different ways that we could format our data with pros and cons to it. I'm gonna to touch on two that actually work really well together and both of which I use in Treelandia. The first is really a common denominator called GeoJSON. The idea is that it's JavaScript objects that uh, make up these things called features. And a feature is nothing more than a geometry which says this is where the thing is geospatially. With trees, it's just points, but you can model lines, other more complex polygons. You just have to define where the thing is. And associated with the thing is whatever properties or information that would be relevant. With trees, it's the name, it's the size, it's, it's other properties that you would see when you hover over it in the application. That concept of what the thing is and where the thing is make up features and GeoJSON. Because these are JavaScript objects, they're pretty flexible. You can build them and change them at runtime pretty easily. But in order to use them on a map, you have to have all of that data you want to visualize in the browser with you. If you have hundreds of thousands of data points with a lot of properties for each feature, that's gonna take up a lot of space and a lot of time to chug through. So this excels as a data format if you're dealing with smaller data sets or things that change often, such as tracking the real-time status of where something is in space, like a delivery truck. The flip side, the complementary format that I also use are what's called vector tiles. Now, each one of these tiles actually contain a lot of GeoJSON features themselves. 
but they're optimized and load in a parallel way as you would pan and zoom throughout the application so that you can very, very quickly paint and respond to a lot of information. And this is because they're compressed and built ahead of time. We're able to optimize that. These are actually SQLite files. Uh, so with that drawback of them panning and zooming to discover more of the data, you don't have it all at once in the browser, which means if you want to find how a feature relates to the entire data set, what percentile it's in, and other aggregate statistics, you'd need to bring your own supporting API to facilitate that. You wouldn't be able to just do a for each or map function like you would with GeoJSON. Because of that, and because they're built ahead of time, the larger, more stable data sets are much more fit for vector tiles. So those are two that really work well together. And you'll see why once we get to how they interact, how a user interacts with the map itself. But before we can get into how you would code that, you need to think from a design perspective what actually would make sense for the data you're trying to visualize. The first big question you probably want to ask is which of the things I'm visualizing can even be interacted with. There might be supporting layers that are just there for visual sake, like these green contours, and you'd only want to hover or click on the blue dots. This could work in our favor, especially if the subset of blue dots that you can interact with are filtered out from some UI and you just show it disabled and only consider maybe four or five dots. This affects the usability in a sense because all of a sudden you could click on something and now you can't. But at the same time, it would keep your responsiveness and performance high because you'd have less data to sort through while performing a particular operation. The last more subtle thing to consider before getting into the code is how might you respond to different zoom levels? We think of responsiveness often as X and Y dimensions, but with maps, you have Z. And if you're way zoomed out and you have things you're, you plot on a map that end up being spatially very close to each other, do they take up the same pixel at a certain height? Does it make sense to keep a level of interaction with those features at that height? It may not. It may, depending on your application, but it's worthwhile to think about as you're designing these applications. So coming back to Treelandia, I use the data sets that we've talked about, GeoJSON and vector tile sets, along with two different kinds of layers that have their own strengths that work well together as well. These can broadly be characterized as data layers and UI layers. The data layer here would be all of our trees. It would be our source of truth. Whenever we would hover and click on a thing, that, that tree that would be extracted would be from the data layer. And so because there are large data sets, they're often vector tiles. UI layers serve a different role. This white ring that's around the hovered tree, it is more transient in nature. There's a much smaller subset of the data, namely one tree to consider. And so the data changes a lot in these supporting UI layers, and they often come from other layers. If we were to click on a layer, extract that feature, pull it into a different layer and style it, now all of our transformations and custom presentation only needs to consider one piece of data instead of all of the trees across Portland, which is going to be a lot snappier. And because they're smaller and frequently changing data sets, GeoJSON is a great pairing. 
So you can see this complementary sort of pairing between vector tile sets and GeoJSON alongside data layers and UI layers. Now that we know a little bit more about how maps work, data gets into them, and how layers might stack, we need to think more deeply about how our map itself connects with the larger application. And my mental model usually comes back to a bidirectional channel of communication. We would need to send stuff into the map to be able to visualize things correctly, whether it's current filter values or some other UI state that says, hey, hide that or show this. And as the map's operating, we also need to get stuff back out of it, whether it's the specific features in the map so that we can do something and display it elsewhere, extract statistics, or it's events that say, hey, I'm done loading, I had a network error, I'm still loading. That bi-directional sort of interface between the two parts, the, the larger application and the map, becomes a very important uh, place to invest some time. There are definitely performance issues that can arise whenever you try and go back and forth. And the best way to, to talk about how those might come up is how you start up an application. When you first load a web page that is a, a map-based application, it would render HTML followed by CSS and JavaScript like a lot of other websites do. But because maps are generally a client-side only library, they operate on WebGL and Canvas elements. And unless we quote unquote pre-render an image as a placeholder, there isn't a lot of server-side rendering we can do. So once we've bootstrapped enough in our containing application, we have to then send some amount of configuration to the map. It loads, can start managing requesting tiles or whatever the data it needs. And once it's loaded enough, it can then communicate back to the application writ large. I'm done, I'm ready, start sending me information. It may not be completely loaded and stable. There may be outstanding network requests for other chunks of data, but at least it can start listening. And to finalize that loop, there may be parts of your application as you build it that really depend on the map being loaded, something being in there, influencing a separate panel or drawer. So all this boomeranging back and forth really takes time and it can be a, a source of race conditions and potential for errors to show up with the, the scary sometimes error. You know, I always want a bug to happen all the time if there's a bug, but if there are race conditions where the application sends a lot of events at once to the map, the map is kind of a black box and it operates on each thing it receives for some amount of time. And so events can queue up in different orders than when they were sent causing something to show in the map that maybe it should be hidden according to the application. That it may be also the case that the application really wants to get going and it starts sending stuff before the map's even loaded and ready to listen to what the application has to say. Because of those two big uh, pit holes that uh, might arise, in Treelandia, I take a promise-based approach with managing that interface. I would start the map uh, like I did in the example back there, and I would collect this set of boundary functions that maybe would update my filters or extract the current click tree and provide a bridge into the actual map API calls. And all of that would be hidden behind something that knows to wait until the map is loaded. 
if it was loaded, then go ahead and do it. Um, but if it's not, I'm able to continually check until it is loaded. This is a technique that doesn't really depend on an event to be fired from the map side. It allows you to pull continuously as you're waiting for the maps to load and then complete and send the information along. All of that uh, leads to a more stable interface between the filters that I have, the selected tree that I have, and loading it up and properly painting trees where they should be on the map, which I will show you now. If I were to click here and see, here's a maple, and maybe remove some of the park trees, as you see, I can refresh the page. And you'll notice that the selected uh, tree that I have is still there. It paints immediately because I'm storing this stuff to local storage. I really want to paint that white ring for where it is on the map as soon as I can to match the panel. But I need to wait as we've discussed until the map's loaded and can receive the event. The filters as well use that same promise-based API where all of these drags back and forth could fire events that somehow take more or less time in the map and end up out of order displaying different values. The promise-based approach ensures that that doesn't happen. All of that to say, this is really well suited for tile set data because trees don't move around a lot. Trees and the tree equity score and the Portland inventory tree, tree inventory don't change their data sets very often. And so I can lean on some of these techniques because of the nature of my data in particular ways. If you were doing something with real-time transit lines, and tracking those, your loading and connecting would look similar in some respects. You would have to wait for the map to load, but it'd be very different uh, with connecting to your external APIs. So some key takeaways from all of this. We have layers, both data and UI. We have data sources, both vector tiles and GeoJSON, and more of each. Pairing the right combination of data formats with the right configuration and stacking of layers is core to a lot of map design and implementation. Preserving that boundary between the larger application that you have and the map that you are interacting with, as we saw with the promise-based approach, will definitely allow you to build features on either side with a lot more safety and a lot more speed. And understanding the nature of your data, its shape, its form, its context, and how frequently it changes is absolutely crucial to knowing how best to contextualize that data in maps. Thank you so much. I've really appreciated preparing this talk for you. The demo is on the first link here. The source for it is on the second link. Please experiment, fork, create issues, uh, play around with it. And the two data sources are also there as well. And if you're interested in anything that I've talked about or in air pollution and air quality or in a mission-focused organization, ACLMA is hiring. We have a number of engineering positions available and you can always apply for future opportunities. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Derek. And also thank you for linking your slides in your AMA on the Cascadia Discord. So, you know, the first thing, you know, I, I've done uh, some mapping stuff um, and the first thing I, I would like to know is where can I find some good data sets to build some of these larger maps off of? 
Definitely, yeah. I mean, data is core to to what the application would be. There's there are plenty of places online with with public data sets. Uh, there's a subreddit uh, on red.com. It's data sets. People trade stuff there all the time. Uh, ArcGIS is a big name in the geospatial community, and they have an open data hub. Um, uh, a surprising one to me that is not so surprising once you think about it is our city and state uh, government sites. There is a lot of work they do out in the open, whether it's counting things, registering things, auditing things. And so a lot of uh, city and state government webs .gov websites have data sets you can download and play around with. That's where I found the, the tree inventory. You tried any federal data sets like the ones from the US Geological Survey? I haven't, but it would be great to combine that with with other contextual data sets to see if there's interesting stuff that forms connections there for sure. Okay, and and do you have you know with with our minute left, do you have a helpful technique to debug issues in maps? Totally. Uh, one thing that's gotten me is layers being out of order. Sometimes things are working; it's just they're they're hidden underneath something that isn't transparent. So checking that is definitely something I reach for, and also just, just making sure that things are in the right place that you expect. Make sure latitude and longitude aren't flipped. That can be uh, definitely a source of issues. And uh, one of my favorite uh, bugs in mapping is Null Island off the coast of Africa at zero zero. Um, if you can't find what you're looking for on a map, maybe look off the coast of Africa and you'll find it. It's like that one uh, IP address that's out in the middle of a lake. Exactly, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Derek. Really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you.